My name is Koshik Guha, and I'm the Executive Vice President of St. James School of Medicine. As one of the top Caribbean medical schools, St. James is committed to providing students with a comprehensive, affordable medical education. Today's presentation features one of our educators, Dr. Manzer Yazji, who serves as a clinical dean for the school. It is my pleasure to introduce you all to Will Wintercross, an international filmmaker, journalist, and producer. Mr. Wintercross began his career at the age of 19, reporting for a weekly newspaper in Botswana, and has immersed himself in challenging global situations over the last two decades. He lived and worked documenting life in Romanian sanatoriums in 2002, covered wars in Syria, Iraq, and Libya, made multiple trips to West Africa during the 2014-2015 Ebola outbreak, and covered the major Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Deeply affected by what he witnessed covering the war in Syria, Mr. Wintercross co-founded the Syrian, Syrian Refugee Relief Fund to provide assistance to refugees in Syria and neighboring countries. His work has also appeared in many notable outlets, including PBS NewsHour, CNN Frontline, The Telegraph, BBC, BuzzFeed, and has been nominated for multiple awards. We're honored to have him with us today, and please join me in wel welcoming Mr. Will Winterfell. Well, thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, and I'd like to introduce you now to uh, an incredibly esteemed um, uh, physician, Dr. Mon Monza Yazji. Uh, Monza, as I refer to him as, we've got to know each other quite well in recent months, has been working in the US for about 30 years. Uh, he's a Syrian American. And we crossed paths a few months ago when I was making a report about him for CNN. And he's going into Ukraine. He's been, he made multiple trips into Ukraine. And he was helping the Ukrainian doctors there. Um, he's providing them with the very specific knowledge that he's learned covering, he's learned working in war zones in, uh, in Syria, and working in Syria as a war zone. He made over 30 trips into Syria, over 30 trips into Syria uh, to help his fellow countrymen there. And so he has a very unique perspective, and you medical students will know that war zones provide, war zones create very specific injuries um, that you don't necessarily learn about in medical school, and these Ukrainian doctors needed his help. So, uh, Monzek, I just want to, I'd like to start with asking you, can you just talk about your journey as a physician, um, and what took you into volunteering into these major global crises? Thank you, Will, and I just want to comment, uh, because the Mr. Koshik, he talked about heroes. As the heroes are really the physician and sitting in the front line and putting their life. And there's a lot of them there. Therefore, I am really, I, I come back and word. I don't deserve that word. They deserve better than us, you know, just to really put that straight up. And we lost a lot of life. But thank you, Will. And uh, really, it comes out from my upbringing when I was younger that I was likely that, you know, driven by parents and the grandfather that it meant to us to help people. Our, our good time, our values come from helping people, how we can impact on people. And I was lucky to be, and then I started that very young in my life thinking that that's who I am, that who our families are. And I started even before medical school. And then it came up into, you know, I had some issues myself, some of it helps or so, and there people stood beside me and make a big difference for me. And I was, I have that, I have to give back. Always I taught that you give more than what you receive. And, when I went to medical school, it was the first things I said in my life, you know, in London, I started actually in London, my school there. And uh, I have some challenges myself there. And again, somebody helped me during that hard time in my early school, since I'm 17 years old, you know, alone there, I never been alone and I have to challenge through school. And it was mentally affected me actually more than anything. And, and there some people stood up for me and they believed what I'm doing and helped me. And this is, was another promise that I need to help like the way I'm being here successful. And this is, was my passion of medical school that I will help to save life. And I have to make different people life. And this is just came in medical school. I started going to do some mission. And every time I go to mission, it was my joy. And I learned a lot in my medical school because my intention is when I come, when I go next summer, I can learn more to help more, which I couldn't do it last time. And this was like chain of reaction helped me to, it's in my heart that this is my best time to go and do work. And that helped me really to raise me to another level that 
it gives me the courage, it gives me that there's nothing impossible when I go to these war zones or when I go to a disaster area, that this is a much better position. And there's a lot of people suffering more. How come I'm not going to succeed here? And how my successful going to be affected them? Therefore, it was positive reaction, which really helped me. And as I said, I made a promise and the problem, the, the issue was when you help somebody and then they ask you for more and said, yes, I'm coming back. And then you feel yourself, you're committed to your world. And then I bring me back to that areas to work. And when I leave there, it's the best time in my life. I see this is the real time. When I come back to, when I'm in the United States, when I start practicing medicine, when I drive, when I fly back to the United States, I'm looking forward to I'm going to be back again there. There are some people waiting for me. And uh, my family, I put like standard in my family, my wife, my children. The principle I put to the house, it stands for, you know, doing the right things and make a big impact to people's lives than my, what you want. You do what's right, what you do for other help, not what you want. And this is driven, it make me able to teach my children first, my own house who we are and with high standard and reflected in their performance, my children, how they do in their life and define our family, the value and define the real medicine, which I really feel. And of course, Syria crisis will to your points. It was specifically for Syria, which I'm from Syria. And, uh, and this time I felt my duty to help my country since I really left it a long time ago. And as you know, the crisis and will know that it was very, one of the hardest uh, 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 thing was against the medical, the, uh, the direct and intentional attack into the medical facilities and physicians and provider and nurses, which never happened in the history before. It was direct, really impact. And we were under siege and we lost from day one, you know, the, there is doctor, I want to say his name, Dr. Baroudi. He's a surgeon from Damascus. He was one of the finest people, thoracic surgeon, when I called for help and he stood up and decided Damascus the first year, 2011. We decided it was Dr. Without Border to meet on the border in North Turkey. I have the head of emergency desk with me and we were there to arrange Syrian mission to help. And I said, I'm going inside Syria. And he said, no, Dr. You know, no, Dr. Yaji, you stay there, we come to you. And they crossed the river and it was at night and they came from Damascus, from Dara, from other cities. And we met him, uh, it was in August 2010. And I hold his hand, I said, you know, we're gonna give you everything, but I'm gonna be going in with you to help because I know he said, no, you stay here, you know, we need you there to keep this life. Anyway, he went back, he was coming back and forth. And after in January, 2012, I was in Florida with Syrian American Medical Society where we were talking and I heard they arrested him from his house in Damascus and he lost his life. He get killed and that why we committed i when i told him we we're going to continue to his family to his mother to the brother of that it make me now keep going and we lost more than hundreds of uh, we have almost documented 186 physician from physician human rights for phys syrian physician and other actually not syrian in syria and that's why you know i decided this is who i am and this is what my journey and i will stand for it uh, it, it sounds obviously, uh, Monza, that this is um, more than just a profession to you. This is obviously a, this is obviously a calling. This is something you feel you have to do. But can you just describe to us what is it like as a doctor? Typically, pre the war in Syria, doctors and hospitals were there was there were sacrosanct places. You could not attack a hospital. Since then, since the start of the Syrian war in 2011, hospitals have been some of the most dangerous places in all of Syria to be. What is it like as a physician, as a doctor? You're there to try and preserve life. And in the, in the process of giving, doing your job, you are being attacked. And in some cases, your colleagues, as you just eloquently described, are being, are being killed just for doing their job. You see, we, we in the, before Syria, we used to, uh, several areas when we worked, we used to identify ourselves very clearly who we are. And we were, you know, identify our places where we are. And we tried to inform all the, people in conflict from both parties that we are physician here this is medical ambulances this is physician here and and we still get you know really uh, it was we lost uh, some life but it was not intentionally that what happened in syria and syria was 
you know, it's, it's unbelievable what happened. We were really, we were the target to your point. We were the target. We were the one targeted. And, and to me, it was, uh, you know, going in and I know this help I have to go, but I was the first, like in Alibo, when we talked myself and you will, you know, we arrived at six o'clock at night and then the rocket was hitting the, our hospital second floor, you know, just a few hours I was working at trial. To me, I was first, it was very, very hard on me to, first I said, I'm losing more lives, you know, right now, what we were th saving life right now, because they attack us directly. Then we have responsibility for these people that came to get help and they get, you know, killed. And then we have patient in the hospital floor, several floors, it was sixth floor, how are we going to get them in? And it was for me, like mentally, physically, everything really so hard on us to see and then i see my colleague lost their life next to me and this is actually with the it turned out with god help to give us more strength to continue what we do not to discourage us to really make sure that we should be in the place what we make impact and our life is not more important than other people's life and uh, saving life is saving the whole world you know it's not isn't like just we save in one life. Therefore, this feeling and this mental process, which I help other physicians when I go to the war zone, like in Ukraine, to make them stand there and not to have fear and to let them enjoy, have the joy in their heart doing that and not to worry about they being, you know, attacked. Because if they want to think about what can happen every minute, we're under siege and that will distract us from work. But it is very hard. It's mentally dragging and physically. Um, Monza, can you just describe to us, uh, are, there any, are there any key differences between helping in Ukraine as opposed to helping in, in Syria? What are, what are the key differences between helping those two different countries? No differences, no difference. You help people, you help to save lives. They are, to me, that's why the principle, when I was in the United States and uh, when the Ukraine crisis started and I watched what happened in Maribel, and I saw them there, you know, their medical facility has been targeted. I just witnessed Aleppo. My heart, I was with in my office. I was not planning to go to Ukraine, really. It was, I was sitting, seeing, you know, we, I have, you know, I'm responsible right now. I, we have a huge operation here, teaching, I'm teaching, as you know, student. I have a lot of commitment, patience, seeing, and a lot. But what I see in heaven in Maribo, I just saw Aleppo. I just saw they are doing, especially we have the same, you know, the same uh, uh, countries, the same people doing, you know, attacking this between the Russian and you know forces you know going direct attack to these facilities i said wow this is what we had before this is what i went through this is what our you know team went through in syria and these people need our help these people i could see what they're going through i could feel them i could feel the physician what they're scared from and i said you know what we i have to be there i made my ticket the same night i really it was the same night i said we are these people or ukrainian people deserve my help like i did to my syrian people i save a human regardless of their color regardless of their religion regardless of their ethnicity physicians should stand for their value they give similar help similar feelings similar love similar care to whoever human and this would define i came home i told to my children actually my wife scared that time because she said i knew you might say that i was I was thinking here and I think because, you know, we say, when I say it, she knows she has to prepare everything and we prepare ourselves to go. And then I talk to my children, my, my, uh, I have beautiful children to, to my, my daughter, the girls always connect with me then boys. Sierra, my daughter in Oxford, she called me and she said, my mom said, you're coming dad. Are you sure? Are you sure you want to do it? I said, yes, she was, you know, she's, she stood there. She did not talk for a few minutes she said i'm scared that you know we were always say you're you know you haven't been there sometimes and uh, but i know you want to do it and uh, i wish i'm with you because she went with me and we decided that that's who we are we have to stand and ukraine people is deserve my help and my care and that's why we i left second day i really left just the second day after uh, i saw ukraine what happened in ukraine and this was my first trip Monza, can you describe what do you think it feels like for the Ukrainian physicians and other medical staff 
to have someone coming in from a, from a different country who isn't Ukrainian coming in to help them? What do you think that does for their morale? Or, I mean, there's obviously the skills you're passing on, but do you think it helps their morale, makes them feel that there are other people caring about them? Absolutely. Well, absolutely. What you said is really, this is one of my big goals also, beside, you know, giving direct help to the patient and helping to teach other people, the other physician, how to carry certain procedure is really helps them directly. Physician wellness and provider wellness is essential to, you know, sustain any work and to help to make the quality of work is high. That way, this physician, there's no way to describe the way they are going through and that they cannot leave their position. They're in the front line like soldiers, but they're more difficult for them because they are in the spot that they everybody attacking them. When you're in a, when you're actually in an army, it's easier for you because you're somewhere and you can run away and you can hide there and you can maneuver. But that's a facility. They have to be there. They have to be in that location because this is when the cases come to them. Therefore, actually, is more danger than anyone else. It's like you saying, "I'm here." And I'm here to help, but I'm here also if you want to kill me almost like the place. Therefore, it's a uh, it's very disaster. They have shortage of their, you know, supply, medical supply. They have shortage of their, you know, uh, human resources. They are under siege. They have no hour to rest. They work in long hours, mentally, physically exhausted. And they have family they cannot see. Their children somewhere, you know, they cannot leave. And for all this reason, I go and make them really feel better. I show them that uh, solidity with all the physicians around the world. We show them there's people listening in the United States. I'm the voice of a lot of people. We have, you know, we're going to be with you. We're going to share our experience. And, uh, and that make a big impact. Well, that's really make, we connected. I mean, after I arrived the first day, it was like they know we know each other for years they come we sit together we eat together we sleep together we work together and we share stories and i show them picture what we did in the past i talk about syria i talk about damascus i talk about i was in damascus under siege i was in Aleppo under siege i was in you know uh, in adlib over siege if you know magaras you know uh, hospital you know i i was there i was in several areas and i said look at me we are here God is taking care of us. We will be fine. I'm coming with you. And this is, they told me that this, your word is just, and we talk and we make fun and we are talking and, and we seeing who we are and define. And that why it's a big support. And um, Monza, can you just describe briefly in a few sentences, what do you, what do you do to try and, and protect yourself from the incredible danger that's in the environments you're going into? We have first to, you know, to do something we call it uh, wisely. You know, first, I mean, we train ourselves. I train myself, I have trained ourselves in a different, you know, logistically, strategically, um, you know, even uh, mentally, even uh, medically, how to be in a war zone. It's not just you have to go there, it's not the idea. That way we prepare ourselves. We really try to uh, train. I get trained by the NATO, I train by other people how to do war zones and how to be survive ourselves to protect ourselves and how to able to affect therefore from this point we have some good training and which we share with other physicians secondly you know we really at this point uh, it's nobody will uh, understand that until he's been there if you're really really a good physician is really value based physician it's a joy that you know yourself i am here and I'm gonna be able to change people's life because of me here. And whatever danger, I'm in God's hand. You know, it's really God is He the only one can maintain my life or take it. And it's a feeling like pilgrim. To me, I'm happy. I forget about the whole world. I forget about all stress. I forget even about my children. That's really the moment you don't really feel about, you know, children or wife because you're in a position in God's area, in God's hand, to make different. And uh, especially when I see this injured child come to me and I, I hold his, stop his bleeding or I stop his, you know, uh, suffering or I help that injured women or elderly people. I talk into them, I connect, they make me feel so good when I'm able to make this impact. Therefore, it's a different feeling. It's a, it's a scary. I told you that will, when I go there, it's very scary. I'm get, I get really my heart 
Is this the last time I'm gonna be seeing my family? It's maybe the last time I'm gonna see my own city when I take off back Allen. I see, and then I was thinking when I done, when I leave Houston, I say this is the last time I'm gonna see Houston. I like I'm saying goodbye Houston. Then I go there and uh, I'm scared. I'm very scared. I'm, this is the worst time actually. You know, you left your family. You say that's it, and you say what shall I tell them? What shall gonna happen? And what shall I have to do before something happened to me? Did I cover everything? And sometimes I call some people. And but when you're there, when you get into that area, when I go into Ukraine and driving toward Kiev or Kharkiv or whatever you know areas, with my team, we have excellent team with me. We've been together. It's a joy. Now we are. This is who we are, and we spend that time. And then the best time when you turn around and say, you know, I'm coming back. I'm still alive and i drive back and i start getting closer to the border of uh, in in the case of ukraine border of poland and i said still because until i really cross the last you know almost you know yard of ukraine because they are right now as you know russian is bumping all ukraine everywhere and every vehicle moving everything in their target therefore until i pass that line i say you know what now I'm really, uh, you know, with God help, I know there's no wars, you know, no war right now, but if I wanna die, it's gonna be out of the war zone. And that way, it's, this is a feeling. Um, Monza, can you just talk about, I remember you telling me when we were together, uh, one of the key lessons you learned in Syria was the importance of, of carrying out skin grafts as soon as possible to reduce infection. Can you just talk, can you talk about that process and also any other key things you learned in, in war zones in Syria or elsewhere that you think would be interesting to, interesting to the students? Yes, it's uh, the, when you are in a war zone, the, the injuries you see there is different than any injury in the whole training or different, totally different. It's usually massive injury. It's a from, even you say about burn, is a third or fourth degree burn. If it's a trauma because of the shrimpel or because of direct impact or building, it's a huge trauma. It's like losing a lot of skin losing muscle, losing uh, the bone is fractured, multiple fractures. Therefore, when we try to put every external fixator, we put the bone, the faster you can, you know, cover this area correctly and you, uh, you have the supply, uh, you have the uh, circulation back quickly there and you cover it quickly, you really prevent long-term complication. Me, uh, first of all, for amputation, the link you know uh, later on also the infection was because in syria we learn we we take care of the primary you know at the the first time when we saw the injury and we said we did the right thing but later on after a few weeks or months we have a lot of complication and it's hard for the one to heal and then we have infection that way the first thing to do really to be able to learn how to sustain the circulation and the nerve function to that area and then cover it with the flap we call them the flaps is very, and there's a few people can do it that way. Dr. David, we learned from Dr. David Nutt. He one of the war trauma surgeon known in the whole world. And we have other people I worked with. From of them was Indian actually help. And therefore I learned it. Even I'm, by the way, just to clarify, I'm internal medicine, critical care with some emergency training, but I trained myself trauma surgery internationally. I learned, you know, I went, uh, I trained that in uh, several places, Europe, in the United States, I trained and also went for training in California. And that way I trained it. I have all the training. I'm not board certified, but I, you know, I manage all the trauma there. And that's why it was something for me, a passion. I did it to save life, to do it, not for me to be, to, uh, to do it as my work or my business or my income. I, do, I use all my credit. This is what I use is only to save life. That way will this kind of type of injury, it's a big impact. And most of the people we go there that when we went to Ukraine, they never done it before. I mean, just with it, it's a special type of surgery, very, very different type of surgery. And you have to really work yourself on it and be part of it and then help it hand on to the other physician. That way, for example, the physician, uh, we were in one of the hospitals and we have orthopedic with us, vascular surgeon, general surgeon. We were about 15 on the room. And one of them, the head of the, uh, uh, he was a young man. I will say his name because he always allows to say his name, Dr. Sasha. And he said, I don't, don't worry, undo it. And he's an amazing person, but he wanted to do that. He, he saw that uh, because we sent some video 
We were sending the video before we went there. We shared this video, how to do it. And he did several of them in the week before and nothing did not succeed because the way to put hand on. That's why when we were with him, we told him myself and Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Not, you know, go ahead and do that. Continue the flab. He was dissecting the skin and he has to sustain the circulation to that piece. And he said, no, I want to handle it to you. I said, no, you continue it. We were talking like that. You do it. You will do it, Evel. We were telling him how to do it. And then he did it all and all his friends looking at him because he said he's going to lose the things. And then he did it. And when he did the flab and when he was like crying, he was saying, my God, this is like the first ever time, you know, it succeeded. And then he did second one in the same day. And then we went left. He was texting us. He said, and actually he's been also that way. We, he's training other people now. He's trained his team. He trained, he went to other city and we're trying to go back. We're going back uh, very soon to do other training. And we're going to do it in two, uh, two big cities in the front line. But that make a big impact on all these people. Imagine how many people able uh, to make a difference. One of them, we were working and a person lost almost his shoulders and he's doing so well right now. He has his picture. We're talking to him and he's moving it. It's amazing just to see the outcome. Well, um, <clears throat> Doctor, was that, are, you, are you referring to the, uh, the surgery that we, we, we filmed as part of the CNN piece? Because in which case, um, we'll have to put in the, after, the show notes after this the link to the CNN piece so the students can find out what you're referring to because we have we have a film of that actually happening. Um, Monza, can you do you have any sort of two or three sort of top tips you could give to the students who ultimately when they leave medical school want to go into war zones and do the kind of work that you've been doing over the last 20 or 30 years? Thank you. Uh, well, this is I think uh, I'm seeing it from my heart to tell you something and this is uh, my I was lucky that I had somebody taught me that from my first, my parents and then my, uh, my teachers in medical school, I have the best and I work with some of them in India, Dr. Sunawala, I worked with him, I worked with him in India, I went to him to work with him just because of his ethics and what he taught me. Medicine is not just going to school and learning books, learning physiology, learning anatomy, learning all this, you know, and then going pre-medicine and then I want to go to medical school and then I want to get myself past my exams and go to USLME and, you know, as an American, if you want to study in the United States, it's who you are. First, you have to focus in your self-discipline. You have a, a physician has to be the most disciplined person on the earth. I told them like prophets. You have to believe on that. You have to believe yourself before you have to convince other people. You have to train yourself. You have to have everyday positive impact around you, not you, in your home, in your friends, in your neighbors. You're passing your neighbor. She saw your neighbor. She's coughing. Say, you know what? I want to ask her. Oh, she's okay. You find your neighbor. She need help. You should help her. That's a physician to start there. You go into school, walk into the school, and you find somebody need help. You stop to help them. This is now you building the, who is that mean, the meaning of physicians, meaning of physician that really you meant for you without any regard, without any gain, you will help to make a people. And this kind of feeling give you self leadership, self esteem high, and that will be open your mind more to learn faster. When I used to learn, I was to learn not to pass my exam. I wanted to learn to make impact when I work in certain area. This is really was really. That's why we work to talk. A lot of us, we work without any, any uh, equipment with us. We have to make a difference. Myself, I said, we, we train by taking a good history, by feeling the patient, feeling the patient, by examining the patient, you're able to find out what he has, what he's need for. And therefore you make a big impact with minimum cost, minimum resources, you're able. Because you learn from your heart to do it. It's like you get another power. I say to my student, they know me, you know, and when they, some of this here, maybe my student, I say, teach them. I say, you have to feel the patient before you think, and you have to care that I doing for him, he trusted me. All of this, when it comes, what I'm doing in my war zones, this is real impact. When you start going that, then now you are carrying the title correctly and you will do well. You don't have to worry about passing your exam. Be yourself learn it to help to save life and you should be all of you doing something next to you today 
Don't say, oh, when I finish, I graduate, I want to help. There's a lot of, in your neighborhood, in the United States, in wherever you are in the world, there's a place people need you. My daughter went to Yale University and she, you know, there she, I found she, when I went to visit her, she said, I want, Dad, I want to take you to a neighborhood next to Connecticut. I went there, there's very poor people, they don't have access to help. She said, I found out we were, she was bicycling. And then we went there. Actually, they recognized her at the end of the year because of that. She was helping population in Connecticut around her because this is what I taught her. She used to go with me, Syria, she went with me, but even in her neighborhood. And that's what I'm proud of, of my children or people I taught. Therefore, help, help, help. Do it from your heart. We are in Alpha Med. I probably, I want to bring this Dr. Yusuf with me here. He's one of uh, very passionate people we are teaching. Alpha Med is meant to really bring an, another training in the United States through, you know, University, St. James University, as our student. To really, I want to teach that with, you know, Alpha Med because I want to teach that what I'm telling you well, before making people just training them to be, you know, passing the test or passing this. Therefore, please, first be yourself, truly the person you think that you make different value. Look at, do the right thing, not what you like. Be in the place you make big impact, not what you want to speak. When I work on this city, no, if that city, as our city next to you, wants you more, that's what you're supposed to work. Not in a city because I like it. And so on, this is all value learned. Well, and I hope you, I can make a difference in this, you know, interview for you in your heart to know that this is real medicine and this is who we are. And look at me, I'm doing so well. My dream was all my life to make impact in people's life in a small town in the most need in the world. I told my wife when I married her, we're going to be very poor probably because we're going to keep helping people. Today I'm doing one of the maybe very most, you know, uh, when my, in my, uh, as a physician in the United States, I'm doing so well financially, blessing, because I did not focus on that. And I'm leading like hundreds of physicians. I'm the CEO for them in Texas and nationally. And there, you know, assess health because of my principle. And people will recognize you, patient will recognize you, your colleague will respect you because of this value, not because, and I'm doing well. It means it really gets you faster and better. Um, well, I don't, I, don't think any, I don't think there's any question in any of our minds, Monza, about the amazing work you're doing. <clears throat> um, it, can, can you give an example, maybe one or two examples of patients that really stand out in your mind? Perhaps it could be in Syria or, or indeed anywhere else. Patients who, who you, 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 think at, you think about at night or who, who have, you, you feel are always with you. Uh, I don't know if I talked to you about, you about, uh, about uh, a child. His name is Zakaria. He's a child who was in Syria and uh, we were in Idlib. And we were actually traveling in a close by neighborhood when a rocket hit the, the, the school and actually small, the small town, the school. And when we went there, we, you know, I identify him right away. He was in a small corner. It was burning the place. Actually, we have to put off the fire first, but he was burned. He was burned almost, you know, almost 80% of his body. His name is Zekari. He was a few years old, three years old at that time or four years old. And I brought him into our facilities and it was very hard on this boy first he lost all his parents all they were dead around us you know we did not save any he was the only surviving that little one i have with me dr Anas because him he's a surgeon trauma surgeon from we i called him to come right away and then we have to work with him we didn't have any anesthesia we didn't have anything in this you know morphine or cysts. we don't have in the place we were there we have to just take because it takes me a few hours to get him where i need to work on him and then when we got him there, you know, we, we took him to a place we can start working on him. Actually, my, my daughter was with me there and there, and we start working on him. But fortunately, we were able to, you know, save him and we were able to help him. But he lost a lot of his body, but he connect to us personally. Actually, I left my, uh, you know, he was calling me like his dad. You know, I, I attached to him. I took care of him. I, I spent a lot, like almost two weeks. I ex extend my visit with him and we put him to Turkey. And then we have him in the Turkey there. I had him in a family because I couldn't bring him to United States. I'm still trying to bring him here. And he's one of the child that really he's right now. It was in 2012. Therefore, he's almost right now 10. He's almost 14 right now, 13. 
it's a uh, he's like a child you know I, he's attached to he's so smart he's doing so well in school but he's one of the kids it's always mine because he's really I felt how this child changed all his life first by losing his family but at least we able God put us in his way to make some impact and to me when I visit there he just wait for us and everybody actually they send me a picture that was uh, you know in my whatsapp that he was talking for me you know asking for me and he knows I'm in Ukraine I wanted to you know I felt so uh, I didn't know that how he didn't know about it but a friend of mine a doctor actually from uh, uh, from Turkey I think they told him and he was saying you know I want you safe and he was praying for me to me this is a very powerful and there's so many beautiful stories it make me going and that's by the way it's make me who you are to your point will but he's one of the will the people i remembered him because of his severity and what happened to his family and he's doing so well right now and it was the uh, good people around him um <clears throat> just so for guests just a quick moment of, of uh, housekeeping do you have a question to ask um can you please make sure that you're logged in because some of the questions that are popping up are anonymous so i don't know what your name is so i can't then say we're now going to go to x or y but in a moment we are i'm mean, going to ask juliana garcia to ask your question um so just be ready for that um doctor can you can you monza can you just talk a little bit about how usam your organization works on the ground with local partnerships yeah we uh, uh, as i told you i work with that was our border i work with safe children i work with the international organization my always whoever need my help i was there in you know in Syria and Haiti before in different part of the world when uh, in 2011 when Syria crisis started I found a lot of people trying to send you know help from different countries sometimes local people talking to the people outside there's so many agencies and therefore we decided at that time with my you know colleagues I visited several countries in Europe UK and uh, France and it was Switzerland uh, USA and Canada and we put a team together we call it the uh, Union of International uh, uh, Relief and uh, Care and Relief Organization, which really we try to uh, consolidate our resources, our team, our work to be more impact. And we formed this in 2000, in January 2012, and we have our headquarters in Geneva. And we open offices, we have offices in uh, in, uh, in uh, UK, we have offices here in British Medical Society, you know them. You know they they joined us there and we have several offices in, in 12 countries and we have in usa also therefore ussm stands for the union of medical relief and care organization and we have more than 1400 uh, people working with us our budgeting we work with the in several areas we work in syria we work in iraq we work in yemen bangladesh we are in ukraine right now we work in uh, in North Africa, we work in South Africa, we work in action in Asia. And it's really trying to deliver the same thing. We work in in all the same trauma, which we put it as we do in public health, mental health, training and, you know, and uh, uh, also building capacity. And we do also patient uh, uh, protection. We do child protection, women protection. And this is um and was the, you know the co-founder. We were five of us. Now we have, we have more than our budget in between forty to sixty million actually euro. We work with you as you work with GIZ. We work with the DFED. We work with USAID. We work with a lot of international and also we have our own supporter from you know people always support like in Ukraine, and that why we we love for people uh, you know whoever wants to work through us to be volunteerly or support. You know, you can go there through uossm.org uh, UO and ussm. Dark, you know, you have in every country, but <clears throat> I like. And just to, uh, you know, you said it, I like to, from St. James, we talk about it. I like always whenever I give any talk or any share any of my experience, I like to have some, you know, something positive came beside, you know, understanding that. And I was motivating that with St. James, we do kind of initiative to create something like that a group of students volunteer to help and we i can help them to train them i can get them the training we can get them the places we can do it everywhere in the world we can do it in their neighborhood and hopefully i know uh, uh kashik and uh, a lot of uh, leaders in san james they supported that and we hopefully will try this you know 
uh, we try to make this available. Therefore, whoever listening today should be part of, you know, doing something to to this extent, not just like I'm listening today and I like it is more that I'm able to make a change on some people's life. Well, we, have a, excuse me, we have a regular question from um, Juliana Garcia um, and she's asked Monza, what do you, what do you do to help you, help to, what do you do to main, maintain that you don't have any uh, downstream mental problems as a result of seeing such incredible trauma? That's, uh, thank you, Julius. I, I think this is, uh, as it's not easy. This is until today, you know, I go to sleep and uh, sometimes I feel down. I feel very, you know, I see it myself when I am there. Sometimes I, something happened in the past Syria. Syria dream still coming, but Ukraine brought my Syria back. That way I'm dreaming back what happened. And the hardest part really when we lost some uh, very great physicians or healthcare, I saw them how they decided to stay in the zone, war zones and to help save life and then they are not alive with me and then I wake up but the only reward I do when I can make I see somebody get better or I save that life and because of my help I make a different in their life that's the only way I can live with this otherwise it's hard but when I see like now the Ukraine helped me to you know Ukraine people I connect with them the hotel I stayed on uh, it was uh, the, the, the receptionist there when she knows me what I'm doing I came back they know they were waiting me for at night I was coming leaving early and they saw me one day I might come I have my clothes was blood and everything and then I was talking to them they know little English they don't speak that much English then I helped her grandma I told her you know her grandma she told me she got some injured and I helped her but I remember them they did not charge me they said they were not going to charge me and then they hugged me then they stared the family came and they they hugged me and they went outside I'm leaving my car and that was to me it was like I forget everything about everything that my mental status my thing it make me feel who I am it make me feel I made somebody that helped me to overcome my mental uh, stress and and uh, I think other thing is my family my little boy way I come here Ibrahim especially now I saw with Ukraine uh his word is is unbelievable he said that you know i'm so proud of you i told you that i wouldn't be like you actually we were some friend last week and they came to visit and he came to the house they came and they said how do you feel brahim how do you see your dad and then he said i want to be like my dad and i want to save life and uh, and i want this is who i want to be i'm studying it was his word i never heard like that this in ukraine and you know he said this is what I want to be. This is what I want to do. And this is the make me so proud of my own family that I'm able to do impact. Well, it sounds, Monza, that you're, what you're saying is that in order for you to do the incredible work you're doing, you need an incredibly strong family around you. And I, I'm sure that you'd probably agree that you'd find it much harder to go to these sort of places without the ability to come home and be in such a loving, caring family. We have, a now, we have another very good question from... Um, Hannah Gills, and she's asked, um, in a, in the, with the limited time you have in a war zone, how do you prioritize which patients need care? In what, in what order? That's a great question, actually. This is the most important question. This is special training. This is different than any triage in any regular life. And we have doctor, his name, Dr. Raphael Pete. He's a formal NATO director, you know, he's from France. We carry this course, actually he did it in Ukraine and he's coming also to do it next month. But this is a very special training. You have to know your resources first. You have to know what resource you have in certain energy, what you can, because as we know, there's a, you're not in a, like in a medical center or, you know, in a place that you have all the resources there and you have your primary, uh, primary intervention, secondary intervention, tertiary intervention. For example, in Ukraine, there's no, there's no air, it cannot fly people. It means from Kharkiv, to Lviv, when they have a lot of care there, it's you talk about 15 hour drive, it, literally 15 hour if you're lucky, it would be maybe 20 hours. Therefore, if you look at your injury and you know that this for me to make an impact on him, it need that threshold care that I don't have it today, I take 15 hours and if he's not gonna get it, I will leave that patient alone. But if you have that support that, yes, I need to interfere to stop this patient bleeding because I can put tourniquet on him 
and within you know like you know i have vascular surgeon that in 15 and five hours or whatever time he can make a difference then i should go to that patient first that way it's a, it's an, a science it's an this is what we teach actually it's a lot of uh, good teaching there but this is when it hurts you sometimes you find a child that he's alive and he's talking to you but you're not gonna touch him because you cannot save him his injury there's no way he's gonna survive and you leave him and you go to another person to work and your eyes on him and your heart is you say i'm leaving him i you know i should have left him because i could have left if i have this but i left him because his injury i cannot he has a bleeding in the brain and this is not going to be survived after three four hours and i don't have a neurosurgeon and that i don't have facility therefore it's a very good question it's a special training and that's why people might make mistake if you don't have this training or you don't make you know you don't make the right decision not mistake right decision if you don't have that training but, but this is part of our training that's why i do that to train that to be have impact on these people life that's what make me for me i have to do it is i you know that's one of the things we have to do well i mean you couldn't that you've made it very clear there monza just what a difficult uh, line you have to walk um between looking after the people that can actually be beneficiary of the help that you have and obviously being usually working in, in western environments you'd be able to help almost everybody i imagine so that's good that must be incredibly difficult for you to deal with we have a question from um kenley morris which i'd like you to keep quite succinct uh and uh what she's asking is what is the what is the best what's the best sort of path to be getting involved in as a physician uh to work primarily in conflict zones i uh, i missed that question again what was what, question? What, what, if you could in a, in a few sentences monza can you can you just describe what is the sort of the best path that a medical student should go on in order to in order to work in in war zones I th that's that's a very good question. I mean, first of all, you have to be uh, try to start with the basic. You know, you have to be an ACLs trainee. There's a special ACLs uh, training for the trauma, and there's some we do it through. You know, across the uh, Red Cross, they have some training in all their facilities. They have like periodic training. There's other places like it depend on the in, if you're in the United States or somewhere else. But there's the resources always for how to really uh, you know do some basic. We call it you know like all this uh, BCLs and uh, some advanced uh, resuscitation this is first the second really you have to uh, understand how to uh, it's a physical training and this when i'm saying it uh, especially when we talk about war zone you have to be physically fit really it means make sure you train yourself physically and mentally before you think that you know i'll be just going there therefore it's going to have a preparation for you mentally physically and also the skills and then of course, if you uh, have a close, you know, if you have any, uh, my, uh, I will make sure that my uh, information is available for you because I can give you the steps how to go. And we can train you. We have a, train, a team to train you. We have in the United States, we have in Canada, and we have also association with certain, you know, uh, in international with certain, uh, uh, like that was our border or other, you know, MDM or other thing, which we work very close with. We have a lot. We work with almost with almost 20 organizations internationally. We can't train you, but you have to get trained. And there's special training for that. Just to give you will, because you mentioned, I want to say some word and you, I remember that. When I was in Syria, we had the, I have, I was uh, in a place, I don't know if you remember that, Will, when they hit, uh, when they hit in the middle of Aleppo civilian, when they come for the bread, the furnace, they have a break. They, it was very famous because they had an area where people go shopping in early morning and i was just like two blocks from there and i was actually just leaving that area to you know get some bread and i was blown our car and it was people almost hundreds of people that you know around us you know in the circle you know dead or injured anyway we got any whatever we can our car i had six with me and then we have other car and we came to one area i was the only md and i have a woman an elderly woman she was you know she, i saw her she put in her hand she had a jacket because it was winter she had her jacket on and she was blood i saw some blood i said are you okay I said no no i'm okay go and save that child you know he's uh, he's okay and then i went there i said are you okay because i'm talking to everybody when i'm doing it. he said yes and then she was going like that i saw she almost did. i said i come mom are you okay what do you need help what do you, and i'm not hurting i'm fine i just don't worry about me there's another woman and she dark me for other she, she got me to help everybody and I thought she's okay when I came back to her she's dead and when I looked at her she was in her chest 
but she really wanted me to help other people. And this is one of the cases when you said, it's just so many memories, it was real. Actually, we had a video because our team was, we have in that place, it, it was at the, you know, uh, the hospital get attacked in Syria when I told you, uh, God bless you. you, you know the hospital, you said you were there. It was that emergency room, you know, and, but this is one of the cases that, you know, it showed that when you say triage or something, it was actually, she had, she directed me to help somebody, but she left her lot. And there's some people in Ukraine, I have similar case that an old man, he, we saw, I was helping him. He said, I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, you can, but when we found out his injury was amazing, he was, you know, his injury was so traumatic, but he wants us to help other people. And this old man and we saved him the good thing we we took care of him but he, he sometimes the patient asks us to go and do it somewhere else well hopefully that question hopefully that uh, part of your answer there monzo has answered um catherine ender's question about the kind of training that uh you could hopefully provide or any kind of mentoring um we've got a question from joe chavez uh and he's asked was your was your life ever in and I think I know the answer to this question, but was your life ever in direct danger carrying out your medical missions? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that's why uh, uh, when I went to you go back, I say, how many chance we're going to be God want us to chance? Yes. Uh, and it was really uh, several times direct. It was one of them actually directed against me. It was, you know, driving one of because the uh, uh, just I want to disclose that my name was very well known in Syrian government and I was attacked directly because I was, I'm the head of the mission in North Syria medical mission that's why I was the one getting help to the physician and main sources of supply chain of supply that way every time I go there it triggered I know sir, some people spy or something then I see ourselves under you know under attack and uh, but several times it was there and uh, Aleppo M1 it was one of the hospital we arrived uh, this is the one uh, I was there under, uh, you know, almost for two days until they found us. But this is was the longest we were, you know, and under the rack. And we were hit the first rocket hit in the second floor. I was in the first floor, you know, working a child uh, for in his head. And then we get hit. Then we asked to evacuate, evacuate the hospital. I helped everybody to get out and we're trying to evacuate. And we took us after 15, uh, 15 minutes or 18 minutes, we get the second rocket. When the second racket had it, it closed everything on us. We were that we couldn't. Uh, and at that time, this is when I, uh, this was very close for me that I'm not survived. You know, I, I talked to my wife in Mersat and I did not tell her what happened. I just want to listen to her voice. Then my daughter was on the, on the hall. And uh, this is the case I felt was very close. This is it, you know, this is the time, but with God mercy, you know, we survived, we get out and, uh, Everybody was looking for us, and actually, they announced, uh, you know, uh, my team. They were like saying that I'm done, and all my team was on the borders in Turkey. They thought, you know, I'm gone, and uh, the doctor in Syria actually they couldn't. We have a special room. They were chatting that Doctor Yaji is not there anymore, and we had it for several, almost uh, 24 hours. And when I get survived by it, helped actually by some American help. And uh, some people, they know that they went after to find us. And, I st uh, and uh, when I wake up, I wasn't sure what injury I had or so, but thank God it wasn't something serious. It was just mine and mine at minor. It was some trauma, but this is one of the closest, but other one, we were in a car and we were just the, 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 the airplane. They were on top of us, the Russian airplane. It was two of them. And we were just in the dark. We were driving without light, without any break. We have to get everything off at night and we were me and doctor and his son dr dia he's still there and with his son was us 12 years old and we have ambulance with us and they were after the ambulance and they hit the car in front of us we were curving out we, it was like one hour chase this was direct attack and then we have several other attack in a hospital but uh, the good uh, the good thing is when i say that is god is looking after us that way i'm here today that way i'm talking to you because God, you know, is was protection. There's no other way. Okay, and uh, Monzo, um, we've got another, another good question from uh, Joe Torres, um, and she and uh, he, he would like to ask you how important are leadership skills when working in uh, working in war zones, especially working with people from different nationalities in different countries. 
uh, again, uh, I, I missed part of it because I missed, I think my, my sound went off. Go ahead. Um, the question from Joe Torres is, um, what, how important is it to have good leadership skills when working in war zones, dealing with people from different nationalities? It's a, it's a very important to balance between really you have to have leadership when you know, I'm the head of the mission. And for this, we require a lot of, uh, you know, knowledge first, of course, and passion, of course. But you have to make a decision, hard decision, and everybody has to have a team around you that really responds. In the meantime, you have to be very, very respectful to the local people, very respectful. That way, it's a fine line between make sure that you really, you know, make the good relation and always work good because they know they trust you. And when I go to people to work with, I make them feel that I am really part of them and I'm here to be part of them, not to tell them what to do. And I show them the work. We show them the work. We don't tell them, don't do this or do that. We, we hold, put our hand on the patient. We, we do it right and they're watching us. And then they know this is a better way if they're not doing it. And then they let us lead sometimes. And, and this is what happened in Ukraine, actually. The first time I went to introduce myself, the people look at me, who are you? You know, why you are there? And uh, I mean, I have to go some of uh, a lot, especially they don't speak the language. You know, most of them speak Russian and Ukrainian. And I don't speak neither, but I have, I have the, I trained some of my, uh, I call the very close team members, which I train. He was, a, he speak uh, Ukrainian because he was, went to school there in Ukraine. And he explained to them why I'm there and everything. That way, building trust. First thing you build trust. I understand the ground, understand the people. Then we start making a plan together with them, not alone. And then, you know, I come to see my resources when I'm going to get in. And, that way it's a process but you have to be a leader there you have to be responsible you have to be able because people life depend on you especially when you have teams that you they follow you and in ukraine i have several people they came from uh, they are syrian and they trained them myself for 10 years i have a student medical student i trained him he was in medical syria in Aribo medical school i trained him myself then he came to turkey i trained him there and actually he has some training in the uh, in United States. And I had him train here. And then whenever I call, he's there next to me. You work that way, you have, you choose your team and you, they help you to achieve better goals. Well, we're kind of running towards the end of the, uh, end of the session quite soon, uh, Monza. But I just wanted to ask, I've got another question from uh, uh, Sweetha Jalan. And they've asked, uh, they've asked you, um, is it, how different is it, how different is it working in somewhere like Haiti versus somewhere like Ukraine or Syria? Yeah, it's a big, big difference. Haiti, uh, first of all, you know, that you understand what type of disaster you're dealing, you understand what could happen, even, you know, or could, could re, you know, it could happen anytime, but you have some predictors, you have some people and you know, this is in God's hand. It's not like somebody attacking you or so. The difference in Haiti, it was first because I was the first response and I was at the general hospital. And I had only, it was only physician, it was me first, maybe 12 hours, 14, then people start coming to help. But uh, I have help from, I have an account me from uh, US Marine. I have several US Marine. I have uh, firefighters from New York. Beside that, I have a lot of good support, skilled people. Therefore, it's, uh, it was very hard in, you know, there because the disaster was so magnificent in Haiti, but at least, you know, it's not being threatened directly by, you know, a direct attack or uh, by like for uh, like an army after you. It's not like a person, it's an army. You're talking about Russian, you know, forces really with all their power coming after us. Uh, that's a big difference. Um, so one last question from Veronica P here. Um, she's, Monza, can you, in a few sentences, can you just say, can you describe, oh, the question's gone, but what she was asking you was, can you just describe um, in a few sentences what would medical students or indeed once medical students become doctors need to do to prep themselves, to prepare themselves to go into the kind of places you've been to? They have to start volunteering in their own neighborhood. First of all, they have to do that. Uh, you know, you shouldn't just leave your neighborhood and they need help or whatever and say, you know what, I want to go there because this is a feeling you have to develop from your heart. And that takes really, therefore, start from your own neighborhood. You have to believe that you really make a big impact. And whatever it is, it could be medical, could be non-medical, could be relief, could be anything. 
after that, you get yourself, you know, like what, uh, what kind of timetable? Said, you know what? I wanted to spend the first months around my neighborhood. My, I'm reading about preparing myself with Red Cross or with Dr. Yaji or whatever, you know, to get trained. And I send you some material. Now you prepare yourself to read and understand. That way it make yourself really mentally first, as I said, you know, emotionally, mentally around yourself to build this. Uh, and I told them always like, uh, if, if you're my medical student, because some of you, I put, I draw the six steps. The first step is really to first have the knowledge. You have to have a knowledge really who you are. And what it means knowledge about you, your strengths, your weakness, everything. And you have to identify that. Next, you have to motivate yourself. Like today you are here to be motivated to do something. Third, you make a plan, make very clear plan and short and long-term plan that I want to do this here, my neighbor, then, then you start doing it. Don't just think about it. Start doing it the same day and say, I want to do the plan. Then look at yourself and say, did I do what I promised myself to do? Did I achieve what in this one? And if you did, then I say, now I'm maturing. I want to reach to go to that farther step. It's a step you have to do it. And this is, will help you. Well, Monza, that's a very uh, good point to finish on, the fact that you need to ground yourself in your local community before you move on to, to slightly more dangerous and challenging places uh, found overseas. But I'm, and I'm sure that the students um, are on this, in this webinar, and myself included, would love to talk to you all day, but uh, you, you're, busy, you're a busy doctor, so you need to get on. Um, so I'm now going to pass it back to the medical school, who I assume are ready to receive. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will. And I, I want to thank you, Will, because uh, when look at how I meet when I do something like that. I meet like people like Will. It's real people. They really believe in the mission. They are passionate. They really put their lives. the same. I'm putting my life. He put his life. He helping refugee had a program to help people until today. He talked to me about it. This is who you meet. This is I did not say that I should say it at the end that when you do mission like that, you meet the finest people in the world, the best from everyone, medical and non-medical. And that's why your really network is the best network. I just wanna finish this. And I like from uh, Koshik, I know he's dying to take over from the St. James. I really looking forward. And I think they really trying to put some program in a place for uh, to cover some of the people, you know, asking for training or participation. And you can make it St. James, you know, medical school initiative to really start learning there. And you can be part of it and we can design it with you students with you. You're part of that. It's not like I can tell you what to do. We listen to you and you give us your idea. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Monza. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this event to, uh, today. Thank you to all our students who have attended. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yazji and Mr. Wintercross. And thank you so much for taking the time to share your experiences. The effects on war on people are devastating. And I hope that the experiences that both of you have shared with us today inspire some of our students to emulate you especially the future physicians who are, in, who are in attendance today. We're very grateful to both of you for all that you do and have done for everybody in the world. As, and as always, Dr. Yazji, it's always an honor for us to have you as a leader of our clinical education program. And as uh, Dr. Yazji earlier mentioned that there were a lot of questions about training. Uh, in, in my humble opinion, uh, the, some of the things that you truly need is an international exposure and exposure and, uh, to different cultures and religions and mentoring from people who have very similar experiences, uh, much like Dr. Yazji. And Dr. Yazji heads our clinical program in uh, South Texas, and uh, a lot of our students head over there. And in many cases, Dr. Yazji trains them personally. But again, thank you to uh, you, Mr. Wintercross, and thank you to uh, you, Dr. Yazji, for taking the time to have this discussion with our students.